The Combahee Rivers, a Black Feminist Statement, is a seminal text in recent Black feminist literature. And their main point in this text is that their liberation is a necessity understood only by them and that only they can be relied upon to work on their liberation. And we'll see why they believe this to be the case as we look at this text as well as Kimberly Crenshaw's Mapping the Margins, which discusses the importance of intersectionality. So the Combahee River Collective is a black feminist group that met during the mid to late 70s so that they could clarify and practice their black feminist politics. And they state that, quote, we are actively committed to struggling against racial, sexual, heterosexual, and class oppression and see as one particular task the development of integrated analysis and practice based upon the fact that major systems of oppression are interlocking, end quote. So the Combahee River Collective is being inclusive about the kinds of oppressions that they see as important to fight against. And the reason for that is that the particular women who belong to this group, whose experiences and histories are represented by this group, suffer all of these kinds of oppressions in a unique and particular way, uh, because these oppressions are interlocking. To say that oppressions are interlocking means that to experience sexism is not the same as to experience racist sexism. So white women generally experience sexism differently than black women. And of course, sexism and racism are also interlocking with class and sexuality and other forms of oppression. So in the first section, the Combahee River Collective discusses the genesis of black feminism. They explain that the origins of black feminism are located in the continuous life and death struggle for both survival and for freedom or liberation from oppression. As they note, there have always been black women activists. Some of them are known, like Sojourner Truth, Ida B. Wells, Harriet Tubman. And they also state that there are thousands upon thousands of unknown black women activists. In fact, the Combahee River Collective is named for Harriet Tubman's military operation in which she freed over 750 slaves. Interestingly, this is the first and only military operation led by a woman. So this should give some indication that a black feminism is concerned with an on-the-ground active political liberation. Black feminism has addressed how sexual identity combined with racial identity and class identity makes their particular situations and their political struggles unique. Black feminist politics is connected with both second wave feminism and black liberation movements. Yet there's a kind of disillusionment with both of these movements because second wave feminism is racist and black liberation movements are sexist. So the Combahee River Collective feels the need to develop both an anti-racist politic, unlike the white women's second wave feminist movement, and an anti-sexist politics, unlike that of black men in the black liberation movements, as well as white men. So importantly, the beginnings or the origins of black feminism come from the personal experiences of, black, of particular black women's lives, including women who don't necessarily define themselves as feminist, but who have experienced sexual oppression as a constant factor in daily existence. So the Combahee River Collective is concerned not only with the lives of feminists per se, but the lives of black women in general who experience sexual oppression as 
part of daily existence. And this sexual oppression is unique to black women. To discuss sexual oppression is not to discuss it as the same among all women. Black women experience sexual oppression or sexism in a unique way because for them they experience it as interlocked with racism and often classism and heterosexism as well. So as children they know how they were told to be more quiet so that they were ladylike but also to be quiet so that they were not objectionable in the eyes of whites. It's not only sexism that is a constant daily presence in their lives, but also at the same time, a unique kind of racist sexism and sexist racism. Racial politics and racism are pervasive factors in daily life that don't allow most black women to look into their own experience or to build a politics that will change their lives and their oppression. So the economic position of black women is at the bottom of the capitalist economy. Though as they know, tokenism has allowed some black women to gain tools in education and in employment in order to fight oppression. In the second section, the collective states what they believe. And first of all, they believe that black women are inherently valuable. So they're coming from a place of identity politics that takes the lives of black women to be important. Uh, their liberation, they say, is a necessity. It's not an adjunct to the liberation of white women or black men. So they're putting themselves first out of necessity for survival. Uh, we'll see more about the ways in which black women's suffering and liberation is left out of both racial politics and feminist politics more when we look at Kimberly Crenshaw's Mapping the Margins. So the collective explains that the oppression and liberation of black women has never been considered a specific concern and certainly hasn't been seen as a priority. The cruel, murderous treatment of black women indicates just how little value has been placed on the lives of black women as the collective says, the only people who care about us to work consistently for our liberation are us. So their politics evolve from a concern and love for their own health and liberation, the health and liberation of other black women, and the health and liberation of their communities. And focusing on their own oppression is rooted directly in identity politics. They argue that the most profound politics comes directly out of their own identities. And for black women, this is both dangerous and revolutionary. Again, this will become more clear when we look at Crenshaw's piece. But as the collective states, black women are left out of racial politics because racial politics is inherently sexist. Black men are concerned with black men. And Feminist politics is inherently racist. White women are concerned with the struggles and liberation of white women. So, so for this reason, black women have suffered a great deal of political erasure and exclusion. And so putting themselves at the center of their political agenda can be seen as dangerous in this way. As they note, it can be difficult to separate class from race from sex oppression, since for black women these are often experienced simultaneously. So unlike second wave feminists like Marilyn Fry, for example, who we read early on in the semester, the Combahee River Collective does not advocate separatism, but they want to struggle with black men against racism, and they want to struggle against black men over sexism. The liberation of all oppressed peoples necessitates the destruction of the political economic systems of capitalism and imperialism, as well as patriarchy. But on their view, a socialist revolution must also be both feminist and anti-racist. It has to look not only at class struggle, but also at struggle against sexism and struggle against racism. And this is extraordinarily difficult since there are sanctions in the black communities against black women thinkers in ways that 
don't exist for white women thinkers, especially white women of the middle and upper classes. So they despise what men have been taught to become, but they don't believe that sexism is essential to maleness. That is, being a man does not essentially make one an oppressor. On their view, taking a biological determinist view or an essentialist view is a dangerous and reactionary basis upon which to build a kind of theory of liberation or a politics of liberation. And so they're rejecting the kind of separatism that white second wave feminism embraced. In the third section, they talk about problems in organizing black feminists. And they state that one of the primary difficulties that they have had is that they're not like white women or black men trying to fight oppression on a single front or a single axis or even on necessarily just two axes, as some white women may be. They're trying to address a whole range of oppressions that are interlocking, and thus they don't have racial privilege, they don't have sexual privilege, they don't have heterosexual privilege, they don't have class privilege, and so they don't have access to the resources and power that certain groups who do have any one of those privileges do have access to. Recall Macintosh's piece on that invisible knapsack. If you're a black woman, you don't have any of the privileges that automatically go to males, nor do you have any of the privileges that automatically go to whites. So if you're a black male, you have access to male privilege. If you're a white woman, you have access to white privilege. And these privileges, despite the fact that they're not often consciously acknowledged by those who have them, allow for access to particular resources and power, social power, that black women do not have access to. Moreover, the psychological toll of being a black woman in our society cannot be underestimated. As the collective notes, there is a low value placed on black women's psyches in a racist and sexist society. They state that we are all damaged people merely by virtue of being black women. Yet, they also argue that if black women did achieve liberation, that would mean that every everyone else would also be free, because their freedom necessitates the destruction of all systems of oppression. So they're at the bottom of the barrel, so to speak. So as opposed to if black men achieve liberation or freedom from racial oppression, black women still would not be free. Similarly, if white women achieve liberation from sexism, black women would still not be free. So if the liberation of black women could be achieved, on their view, this would mean that everyone else would be free because they experience the interlocking oppressions on a number of fronts. A problem for black feminism is that feminism is threatening to a lot of people in the black community, both males and females, because Blacks believe that sex is a determinant of power relations. They cite a statement by the Black Nationalists that discusses the different roles for men and for women and how men are heads of households and men have all the power and the rationality, et cetera, et cetera, much like white men have been saying for, for many years. So the material conditions of most Black women would not lead them to upset the economic and sexual arrangements that allow for a minimal amount of stability in their daily lives, even though they understand the ways in which sexism and racism affect them. And further, the reaction of black men to feminism has been notoriously negative, and this continues to be the case today, since the needs of black women are not always in alignment with the needs of black men. And again, we'll see this even more clearly in Crenshaw's piece. Finally, in the fourth section, the collective discusses black feminist issues and projects that they have been involved with. As I said earlier, the collective has an inclusive politics. They're concerned with any situation that limits the freedom of women, third world people, working class people, especially those people who are struggling with racism, sexism, and class issues, since these are simultaneous factors in oppression. 
So the members of the Combahee River Collective have worked on various on-the-ground political projects, including sterilization abuse, abortion rights, battered women, rape, health care, domestic violence. And one of their primary concerns is racism in the white women's movement. They argue that white women have made little effort to address racism in the white feminist movement. And that is work that white women have to do. It's not work that black feminists can do for them. So ultimately, the collective states that they're committed to a continual examination of their politics as they continue to develop through both criticism and self-criticism.